Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Mark McLeod, who is here to celebrate, like all of you, our 40th birthday. Um, I think, I'm hoping, I'm sure actually, <laughs> Mark is very well positioned to talk about, um, well, the title of his speech, The Power to Teach, Reach and Inspire. He has an extensive background in um, children's literature as a le uh, lecturer in English education at Charles Sturt University. He's also an award-winning publisher, um, writer, speaker and also television presenter. Okay. Um, he's had a significant role in the children's literature world um, in terms of publishing and, and promoting children's literature and so on. He's also got some current publications out there as well at the moment. Um, I think I'll let Mark actually start because we want, we want to hear from you, um, not me. But I think given the current context in, so in terms of literacy and English education, um, he's got a lot to offer us in terms of, I guess, the power of literature and where it's sitting at the moment at this point in time. So thank you, Mark. Thanks, Jo. Uh, and it's really a thrill to be asked to do this uh, tonight. Thanks so much. I really admire what Peter does and um, have enjoyed my association with Peter over many years. Um, I should tell you that my invitation was very courteous and um, with typical generosity and um, gentility. Uh, the invitation said, we are not hoping for a political statement tonight. Uh, well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Uh, <laughs> quite possibly. <laughs> a, a writer is uh, both blessed and cursed with a good memory. And um, I'm still thinking about a K-6 teacher trainee who denounced me in a lecture three years ago. Uh, we were discussing text types and I said that while they were useful as a concept, that narrative was an art rather than a science and that young readers wanting clear definitions would soon find that the most interesting texts were hybrids. And this woman suddenly stood up and shouted, just teach to the syllabus. <laughs> in her polemic uses of literature uh, in 2008, Rita Felsky contends that literary criticism has completely lost sight of the four reasons that readers say they respond positively to books. Recognition, enchantment, knowledge, and shock. So I spent a good part of this year reading about 2,000 book reviews written by Australian children to see whether the criteria that they cite uh, coincide at any point with, the, with those cited by adult judges of what are good books for children. And I feel strongly that we've risked losing potential readers by the gap between those two. It's so great in Lorraine MacDonald's book to see a chapter headed emotional responses to literature um, because that's one of the things that we've missed. That's one of the things we've missed big time. Um, I think we've got a lot to learn from writers about film, to tell you the truth. Uh, Blake Snyder says that there isn't a successful film where the audience does not care about the characters. Mm. It's really simple, it's really old fashioned, but that's the truth. Um, it doesn't matter, and in his book, Save the Cat, he says, you know, it doesn't matter how dreadful the protagonist is gonna be, there's gonna be some scene early in any successful film that draws the audience to that character and makes them wanna stay with that character for the next two hours. Well, they're fairly simple criteria. Um, they're quite old fashioned, but they seem to me to govern the way that children respond to books. What choices might children make if they were the judges? And how do the criteria that they use relate to those that are cited, for example, in the book of the year? You know, as a publisher, some of my favorite books were the ones that none of you liked much, <laughs> or seemed to, judging from the reviews. Billy the Punk didn't get one, not one, good review from um, you know, the people who you, you might expect would think it interesting, and yet it won every single Children's Choice Award in Australia. Libby Haythorn is still, I'm sure, smarting over the Children's Book Council judges ignoring Way Home. And yet, it's still a picture book that I find students absolutely riveted 
into silence at the end of it, unable to speak while they're processing that story. Margaret Clark's back on track. I couldn't begin to tell you how awful and how hurtful some of the reviews by adult judges were, and yet I still find young people telling me how much that book affects them. What they're responding to is, again, the emotional response of the book, um, what it evokes from them. I think I've told some of you before that my youngest daughter, when she was, uh, I think, 11 or 12, um, read Back on Track, and she said, I stayed up the whole night, and I read it because I couldn't put it down, and then I tried reading another book after, but everything else was trivial. Um, so I think about the kinds of books that have touched me and have touched people that I've worked with, um, and I think about my own, now that I'm back in universities working, I wanted to go back to universities to uh, put back into education some of the practical knowledge that I've gained in book publishing and retail and writing and so forth. And I'm back in a position where I can select the books. And you know my favourite book ever from childhood, I just don't want to do it. And that's Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is that I love it so much that I think if I start to name it and, and pull it apart, um, that I might lose some of the power of the book. And that's what I'm really talking about. Um, we do a lot of good in showing young people how books work and how communication works and so forth. But we also might do a lot of harm. Um, I had the bizarre situation this year of teaching a book. Um, I said to students, uh, and this is outside of your realm of course, it's a bit older than the students you're dealing with, but I said, okay, so what would you like to see as a text on this um, course? And they all said, oh, The Hunger Games. <laughs> You know, I read The Hunger Games, I have absolutely no emotional response to that book at all. And interestingly, most of the students did I, didn't either. They found it interesting. They like to talk about the issues, but I'm with the reviewer who said, I just don't buy the basic premise. I'm just not in it. Um, and I didn't feel concern for any of the characters, maybe Rue, for a moment, a moment, in a big book. However, it was a very interesting intellectual exercise. So, thinking about these sorts of things and the power of the story, I went back and I read uh, close on 2,000 reviews by Australian children. Um, I started with Paphanalia, I started then with Jonathan Appleton's Ripper Reading, and then I went to React and all its avatars as Yara and Yara, and a devil of a thing to find on the internet with all those changes, but anyway. The reviews were written by Australian children, uh, aged between 8 and 18. Uh, I chose a period when those two journals or those two sites were uh, very active. Um, and so that meant somewhere between 1997 and uh, the year 2000, basically 2005. And then I chose the last year also, just um, I'm halfway through this project. Uh, I wanted to see if things had changed very much. The categories used to analyzed the reviews were not predetermined, they came out of what the students themselves said. And those were the 10 criteria that they used to talk about a book in a review were the book cover, the authenticity of the narrative, the relevance or topicality, the information potential of the narrative, humour, emotional content, genre and structure, the language used, the pace of the storytelling, and whether the review only retells the story or not. Well, most of those criteria that the children chose overlap with Felsky's four. No doubt the title of Ripper Reading Magazine announces straight away that its emphasis is on reading for recreation. So its reviews emphasise action and comedy. Most of the copy over Ripper Reading's 52 issues is written by the editor Jonathan Appleton. And he often criticises the choices made by the adult judges of the Children's Book Council. In the 1988 Book Week issue, he says, I'm rushing to type up an article on the winners. Usually, I don't get any of them. <laughs> and in 1991, he dismisses two of the winning titles as boring and impossible to finish. <laughs> he says the two most accessible books on the list did not achieve anything, and yet they are the books which I'm sure the majority of readers will look for. There's nothing for anyone under 14, but I hope those readers won't be discouraged. When the 1995 shortlist is announced, he writes, 
What does best mean? Does it mean the most accessible or the most challenging, the best design, the worthiest, the judges' favourite books, books the judges were keen on but thought should make the list? As a guide to children's choices, however, Ripper reading is complex and it's difficult because on the one hand, Jonathan Appleton understands his readers. On the other hand, he clearly wanted to be a writer and publisher from day one. Uh, and as you know, in February this year, he became uh, the editorial director at Hachette in London. Um, so over the course of Ripper reading, you find him increasingly making comments on production values, all sorts of things which place him, position him more as an adult reader than a young reader. Um, however, uh, he is clear about the um, promoting of genres of short story and popular verse anthologies in 1989, Appleton says that these genres have excitement, laughter, suspense, everything you could want. And the best thing is they don't take ages to read. On the other hand, as I say, as early as 1997 in the magazine's third issue, um, he's beginning to comment on the publishing process. Um, so, to a certain extent, Ripper reading is helpful, but it's not helpful. And far more helpful is React um, and the Yara sites. Um, I talked to Stephen James Smolt about his editorial policy in this, and he says that um, he never once interfered with anything that the students had submitted. Um, he didn't direct the reviews at all. For the contributors to React, age 8 to 14, the differences between the 1997 to 2000 and the 2011 to 2012 samples in the present study are not significant. So in other words, over that period of time, the students that you're involved with mostly um, are pretty constant in their criteria. So whatever the job is you're hoping to have done, um, you're doing it well, it seems. Um, so that's gratifying. Yeah. So you can see here the criteria. Um, they're pretty standard there. Not huge differences in them. <laughs> students, a few students have learned not to just retell the story in their reviews. Um, but you can see emotions, uh, the importance of humour. Um, relevance has gone up a little bit. Um, and reality has gone up a little bit, the sense of relevance and reality. The most frequently cited comment, now here's the interesting thing. Um, language is clearly the biggest criterion here. However, the most interesting thing said about language is that the book is easy to read. <laughs> This exact phrase occurs on average in 61% of the reviews that children wrote in this period. The clear expectation of that phrase is that reading is difficult. Although this may be due to the kind of language these readers encounter on social networks, in texting and outside the print media, the phrase easy to read also occurs frequently in children's reviews from 1967. So one of the reasons for going back to the Puffinalia reviews was to see whether this was the case. And the phrase easy to read crops up repeatedly in the 60s, pre-internet. So I don't think we can argue um, that there's, a, there's a, an involvement there of the internet. So this is fascinating to me. Related to the criterion of easy to read in these reviews is the unsurprising emphasis on genre and pace. Um, now I'm going to flip forward to the second lot. Now, here's where your students are going. And there are massive differences in this time period. Uh, for example, um, look at the change from real. The, the, the sense of by this, you know, I'm just using that as shorthand. What the students are saying is, I recognise this, this is out of a society that I belong to, um, it's convincing to me. There are all sorts of uh, comments that amount to their sense of what's real or not. Look at the jump from the late 90s to now. Um, from 28% to 68% of students uh, mentioning those criteria. The importance of humour, um, 31 to 43. The importance of relevance, 20 to 39, just about doubling. This is really interesting because the students are commenting on, is this topical? Um, I, am I recognising the concerns with it? Language is still there as important, but it has jumped too. Interestingly, structure drops. Emotions, much higher, from 33% uh, to 51% of the reviews are commenting on the emotional content. 
Um, it seems that one thing that you've succeeded in doing is persuading that a review does not retell a story. <laughs> so that's pretty, pretty much gone back to zero. But I find this extremely interesting. Um, so their criteria are number one, language, number two, genre and structure, um, number three is pace and the emotional content of the humour. Now, if you look at the judges' comments um, from Children's Book Council, I figure you're never going to see um, some of these criteria uh, cited in the judges' reports. For instance, the, the students' concern with pace. Um, I, on a quick look at um, some of the reviews during the period, some of the uh, judges' comments, um, that was not something that was mentioned. The emotional content mentioned from time to time, but certainly not with the kind of commitment that the students demonstrate. So, the prioritising of pace may be due to the 21st century emphasis on extreme action in content and the speed of delivery in many forms of entertainment, mm -hmm. and the prioritising of authenticity appears to position the book as an old-fashioned narrative medium that plays fewer tricks on the audience than visual media do in the digital space. Needless to say, such an inference would not be based on the post-structural literary texts that lend themselves to classroom teaching very often, and the Children's Book Council shortlist. There's some evidence among these reviewers that book reading may become a casualty of their time-poor society. One 13-year-old boy reviewing Matthew Conlon's The Tunnel says, The tunnel is best suited to older kids out there who are too busy to read a big fat book but want something decent. <laughs> this is where your students are going. However, another 15-year-old boy reviewing Lucinda Hasslinger's Chasing Rainbows offers an even more pragmatic view of reading for entertainment. He says, Though this book isn't going to go down as one of my favourites, if you're looking for a quick, easy book to read, this book will do the job. <laughs> a 14-year-old girl's view, a review of Andy Griffith's best-selling collection of short stories, Just Stupid, expands on the belief that ease of reading makes a book entertaining. If you're looking for a good book on the run, or just a good read, if you're 10 or 103, this is the book for you. If you just want to read the cartoons on each page or have a good laugh by reading the stories inside the wacky cover, you'll give it 10 out of 10. Whereas the study of text types and contingent meaning makes multi-layer fiction suitable for the classroom, young reviewers recommending books for recreation refer repeatedly to the simplicity of the language. One 15-year-old girl says of Stephen Herrick's Black Pretty <coughs> Fingernails, I would recommend this book to anyone who likes decent books with no catches or hard to understand concepts. The tendency towards generalisations about young readers, by these young readers, suggests that these reviewers feel that their peers' interests in reading are not understood. A 15-year-old girl says of Elaine Webster's Stresshead, many teenage girls will be able to read this without stress, which is what many teenagers want in a book. And reviewing The Ring of Water, the fast-paced story of a British samurai by Chris Bradford, one boy clearly addresses a parenthetical aside to those adults who recommend slower, more stylish books for teens. I believe that anyone from the ages of 10 to 15 who enjoys action or emotional events, trust me, many people care for those moments, will enjoy reading The Ring of Water so much that they won't be able to put it down until they finish it. So what's interesting about so many of these reviews is their awareness of the expectations of adults in various roles. I would say most obviously as teachers, but sometimes as parents, sometimes as book reviewers or editors. This is exactly the kind of expression of enthusiasm for reading that the adults who began to despair of the decline in literacy rates from the 1980s onwards, especially among Australian boys, would have been eager to hear. But it's significant that it is published not in a review of a book chosen by the judges of the CBC, but in a magazine specialising in books for recreational reading, chosen by children themselves. Well, undoubtedly the CBC, um, with whom Peter has had a really strong and uh, productive relationship, achieved the aim stated in its constitution of increasing the number of Australian books published for children, raising the quality of production, expanding the network of children's libraries, and promoting the marketing of children's books through an annual book week in the Book of the Year Award. With the introduction of the shortlist, which forms the basis of classroom discussion and activities for half the year in many schools, it also aligned book reading successfully with education and extended the use of real books in the teaching of language from the 1980s on. In doing so, 
it increasingly eliminated from serious contention for the book of the year the kinds of books that children themselves judged to be the best. Commenting on ways to reduce the workload of having to read up to 400 books now entered annually in the book of the year awards, the judges report as early as 1969, I'm quoting here from uh, CBC archives, it is considered that it, would be greatly, that it would greatly ease the judges' task if the 75% or so of the entries which represent the dross could be eliminated as quickly as possible. It is appreciated that the books have to be read once to establish that they are below standard, but it is considered that all that should be necessary if a judge believes a book is beneath consideration is to say so. Get the triple invalidation in that comment. Um, and these comments were not offered to children, but you can imagine what children might think um, if they were. Their use of the terms the dross and beneath consideration indicates that these adult judges of children's books make their decisions by means of exclusion. And as Nodelman suggests, to approach the reading that children themselves love in this way is to be motivated primarily by fear. I'm quoting Perry Nodelman here, all we adults have to do is not to fear. To fear neither children nor books. Not to fear children means to trust their ability to make wise decisions and enjoy playful possibilities once equipped with the strategies for doing so. Not to fear literature is to not eliminate from children's experience books whose representations personally distress us, but instead to allow children access to a wide, as wide a range of representations as possible in books of all sorts from places of all sorts, by people of all sorts. If we can be that fearless, the children will indeed learn to belong to a different world than our current repressed and limiting world of grown-ups. But then we grown-ups will belong to that different world too. We've spent far too much time trying to decide whether a book is good for you rather than good to read and might well have diminished the enthusiasm for reading that children express in the basic kind of criteria Felsky argues adults apply to their own favourite books. One of the most distressing things for me is to encounter very able, intelligent, creative, um, highly energetic students at 200 and 300 level who struggle to work up enthusiasm for reading books in a literature class. Um, so something we're doing along the way isn't working. Um, I don't know what you feel we can do to rescue that. Um, the questions that Felsky asked is, does this book touch me? Is it about my world? Um, does it touch my emotions? Does it make me laugh and cry? Does it grip me and take me, however briefly, to a different reality? Does it confront me and show me aspects of life that are new to me? And while I'm reading it, does it have the power to hold me and simply refuse to let me go. Well, in this 40th anniversary of Peter, I hope we'll teach less so that students can learn more. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for, I think what you just did was teach, reach and inspire all of us. Um, through your story. Um, I, get, I guess the thing that I personally got from that is get putting that focus back on the emotional response to literature, which maybe um, sometimes we forget due to the other forces or voices that are surrounding us in their various forms, and sometimes we forget um, what is it kids actually really want and respond to and, and care about. So I think it's a really timely message, again, considering our current context at the moment. So thank you very much.